to kick things off tonight, I'm going to ask each of our three panelists to set out their response to the provocation. Will the EU emerge from the pandemic in a stronger or weaker position? So Frederick, let's start with you. All right. Thank you so much. And um, also thank you so much for the invitation to join you uh, this afternoon for the seminar. Um, I think I'm going to cop out on that particular question, Sophia. And uh, well, if I have an answer, it's probably going to be sort of neither nor, or perhaps both. Um, in the sense that sort of my, my analysis is that um, the European Union itself has been sort of on a, uh, on a bad trajectory for quite a while. Um, even if I... I mean, I can see that there are a few countries that may uh, sort of in the near or distant future um, um, may, they may sort of join the UK to leave the European Union. Um, countries like, for instance, Hungary, I, I don't see that really sort of happening anytime soon. But sort of the bad trajectory that the European Union has been in has been uh, more sort of eroding its capacity to protect the relevance and integrity of the institutions and to sort of come up with policy responses to new situations where uh, sort of institutions, the European Union institutions haven't really had much of a say, uh, like for instance, the migration situation in, in, in 2015 onwards. I don't think the pandemic itself is changing that trajectory very much. Uh, I don't think it's, it's pushing, it, uh, pushing it down either. Um, to an extent, it may be sort of that confronted with a pandemic that virtually every country in the European Union uh, is confronted with. It sort of may uh, help to sort of create more of a commonality and a sense of, of community among, among um, uh, the member states in the EU. But generally speaking, I don't really see sort of the pandemic itself to be uh, neither building more trust nor leading to less trust uh, between uh, the member states. There was a, a time in the beginning of the crisis when uh, that type of issues, I think, became uh, pretty alarming, especially when Italy was asking for assistance with PPE and medical equipment from other nations, and they, uh, for the most of the time, weren't responding at all. They, they weren't even uh, giving them a no, they didn't respond at all. And that led to the point where uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, felt the need to issue an apology on behalf of the entire European Union to Italy. Um, but since then, I think um, uh, at least sort of that trust issues have recovered uh, at least a bit, even if there are still issues there. I think what we're seeing now is that the European Union institutions are sort of struggling to find a position for themselves that is going to be sort of more in the driving seat. Um, and I think sort of the, the big recovery package that was um, launched um, uh, two weeks ago should be seen in that light. I mean, this is, of course, a recovery package that is trying to respond to a particular economic situation, but it also uh, a group of European Union institutions that are trying to find uh, a relevant task for themselves um, in a situation where the pandemic itself and its aftermath is going to define so much of, of what is going on in Europe um, over, the next, over the next couple of years. Uh, I uh, think they are going to um, be mildly successful on their ambition to uh, build up this recovery fund and do what they uh, are proposing to do. Um, the sums involved are probably going to be smaller. Uh, there are going to be m many more restrictions. I don't think that the Commission is going to get its way when it comes to uh, building up own resources, uh, meaning that we're going to see the EU uh, getting the right to sort of take up taxes or to draw on uh, taxes in member states, um, anything more than they can do right now. Um, uh, but it's going to be sort of a, a, a package which is substantial by uh, European Union standards. Um, and I think that's, that in itself is going to, at least in the first place, I think, help to recover even more some of the 
trust problems that existed in the beginning of the pandemic. But, but again, coming back to my conclusion, I don't think the pandemic itself is changing the longer trajectory uh, for the European Union. I think this is a, this is a collaboration which is uh, struggling uh, to find commonality between countries about uh, what they want to collaborate about. Uh, there are growing frictions uh, between member states that are partly about politics and partly about nations being on different economic uh, orbits, um, with some countries being more successful than others and have the ability or the freedoms to, uh, to basically design their economic policies in, in ways that other countries simply don't have the luxury to do. So for the foreseeable future, I think sort of, it's going to be collaboration, which is going to uh, struggle, um, but it's going to survive. Thank you, fascinating. And, and Georgie, you are there on the ground in Brussels. How do you, what's your view of things? Do you agree that the fundamentals of the challenge for the EU haven't changed and its opportunities, or, or is there something distinct about the way in which this pandemic has played out? Um, thank you so much um, as well to you, um, Sophia, but also to the BCBG for the invitation. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of in, in, which is not what you wanted in the panel, but sort of in violent agreement, I think, with um, Frederick on this one. Um, I think the crisis has basically shone uh, a light on existing problems in the EU. It's not created new ones. So I think the real question for the EU going forward is, is not whether the pandemic means that it's on the brink, but how it's going to manage and evolve as a consequence of it. Um, and I sort of had five points really that I wanted to raise. The first was, um, you know, this very much started off as a health crisis, um, you know, and health is an area where the EU has very limited power, actually. Um, so what you saw on the 18th of May was President Macron coming out and saying, you know, what we need now is the creation of a European Union of Health. It was the acknowledgement that actually when it comes to the EU and by the EU, I mean the EU's institutions handling of the, of the crisis it was actually limited because the EU has very limited power in this field. Where it did act um, rather quickly or wanted to act was obviously on the economic response and, and uh, the economic recovery um, packages. So, it, you know, the Commission got quickly to work. So on the 13th of March, it presented its roadmap. The next day, it presented a plan for new export authorization forms for medical equipment. The day after that, it had created an advisory body really um, trying to help member states think about lockdown, how you could ease that lockdown, how you know you can build in scientific advice in your policy making. Um, the EU, so the Commission jointly with member states launched a joint procurement program um, for obviously you know, personal protective equipment, but also ventilators. Um, and then you saw all sorts of other measures being, you know, proposal to kind of reintroduce, relax Schengen rules, so to reintroduce, reintroduce partial closure border, uh, borders. Um, although I would argue that was largely a response because member states had freelanced and gone and done that already. Um, but there was real sense of, okay, what can we do to help member states? We can relax state aid rules. We can try and relax um, the fiscal rules, particularly around budgets and what uh, you can and cannot spend your money on. Um, and then of course, how much debt the European Central Bank could hold from particular member states. So, but as with everything with the EU, the level of ambition, I think, um, much depends on what member states want the EU to do and how much, how much power member states are ready to delegate to the EU institutions, which again is something that, that Frederick um, spoke about. Um, you know, member states don't always agree on what the EU should do. Um, and they have their own voters to worry about, um, even if you could argue on an empirical, theoretical level that actually, yes, it does make sense to pull resources and to think about new ways. It doesn't always work with, with voters. And I think that's, that's clearly something that, you're, that there's a recurring problem in, in EU policy making, but was exacerbated perhaps at this point. Um, the third point I'd say, which is uh, what I said at the start, the crisis has shone a light on existing problems. And I think here we're right bang in the perennial problem of the eurozone you know can you have a common monetary policy without a common fiscal policy all sorts of questions if you want to relax fiscal rules and, and who do you in, who do you include and who do you not include in those conversations and then i think further down the line that that tension between again you know those member states who have the euro and those that aren't past the eurozone so 
again, um, I think shining a light on, on existing problems there. Um, but like I just like to say with the EU, when, when there's a will, there, there is always a way. And I think you saw France and Germany come together, put forward this proposal, um, and really member states, including the frugal four, sort of rallying behind it tentatively and saying, you know, well, we'll have to see what it looks like. But again, sort of signaling that there was appetite to do more and a willingness to kind of move beyond the differences and find common ground. Um, but I think the real crucial problem is what happens long term um you know what what happens when this emergency funding or you know emergency package that the money the funding dries out um and you know what happens when those really tricky questions are starting to be asked you know do you want more or less integration um what about these new pandemic powers again that frederick was talking about are member states really ready uh to give the eu more power than it already has um as i said when there's a will there's a way um but the trick of course and the difficulty is to get all member states to see and agree that their common will is actually their common way so we shall see thank you very much georgie so boyan you're on the ground in berlin another big center of uh power and debate within the european union what's your read of the situation there and how this is i mean it's it's obviously played in an extraordinary way into the dynamics in german politics as well so i'd be interested in your thoughts about that within also the context of how it is challenging the european union sure let me also say thank you for the invitation and obviously i, I agree um with uh, the previous speakers Friedrich and georgina and uh, Perhaps I should strike a more optimistic tone, which would be rather unusual for me, as, as you know. But um, I think, you know, obviously everything that was said uh, holds water. And, and um, you know, the, the, the nature of this crisis doesn't really matter because uh, the European Union, right, the old sort of uh, Jean Monnet um, saying it's forging crisis and and we are we're seeing that and we've seen that in the past i mean i've been covering the eu for about 10 years now perhaps even more than that and pretty much every year i write about uh, you know the sort of the tensions within the franco-german motor stuttering the sort of the centrifugal forces being unleashed and whatnot but then they manage you know, the, every time they manage, and I think they go a step forward. So I think it is um, what we're, Georgina was saying is quite crucial. Now we have a Franco-German agreement on the European Union, uh, on actually the European Commission, to issue debt to finance uh, certain member states uh, for a specific reason. Now that's time limited, and and a lot of people have said, and Friedrich said, it's not enough, and of course it isn't enough in terms of volume. But I think it's it's a hugely sort of um, perhaps underestimated historic move uh, because for a German chancellor to stand up and say present this scheme which was an anathema uh, you have to remember eurobonds is is like Satan in Germany um, in in the German government and in in among most German economists there's something they call the black zero. And it's, it's a sort of a um, semi-religious belief that balanced budgets, i.e. zero debt, is, 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 uh, is the all aspiring aim you have to have as a polity. So, uh, you know, they've, trans uh, they've, they've transgressed that. And you have a German chancellor standing together with the French president announcing this scheme, which is time limited and temporary, et cetera, et cetera, and will perhaps be watered down down the line in all night summits um, uh, later this summer. But nevertheless, it's a huge step uh, um, for Germany and, and therefore, uh, you know, perhaps a little step for Europe, but in the direction where France wants to go. If anyone had watched the press conference of the president and the chancellor, you, you, would, have, you would have seen uh, Monsieur Macron smiling really enthusiastically because this, this is a great sort of victory for France in a sense. And the other thing is then in, in the aftermath, the, the German finance minister and German finance ministers are sort of known you know, you have to remember Wolfgang Schäuble, perhaps the previous incumbent. They're not very known for, for fiscal frivolity. And there you have the current uh, uh, finance minister, um, Olaf Scholz, who said this is a Hamiltonian moment. Of course, that's a bit of an exaggeration because the Hamiltonian moment will come when they actually guarantee uh, common debt uh, uh, in, in, uh, perpetually. But he 
however, says himself that this is a option. This is a, a, a something that he personally and the government of Germany at the moment aspires to in order to get the Eurozone in order. And uh, I think that can, cannot be underestimated. So for, for all the kind of, uh, you know, the, the pandemic has really, um, is shining a torch on our on the inadequacies of our polities and our societies, and and of course the, the EU beyond its single market is is a very ramshackle sort of entity. But I think that, that little step that has been made or will a actually be formalized now is of great significance. And and I don't think you know being here in Berlin when the question was asked, right? Do you want the eurozone to start sliding down the tubes, or will you actually sort of uh, accept what used to be unacceptable in the German system. And the answer will be, we will accept, you know, we will move forward, we'll we move on. So I think the Eurozone members have little choice but to stick together. And we, we often speak now in the media of the Frugal Four, forgetting that it was the Frugal Five and Germany was the very central member of that alliance of uh, fiscally conservative countries. And now Germany is in, is in cahoots with France. That's anyway how the group for uh, seeing this debate, trying to, to, to push that progressive agenda forward. So I think a lot has happened within the space of a couple of months and, and more is yet to come. And I think, I think we are actually seeing the, the European Union making small steps or giant leaps, depending on your perspective, towards more integration, perhaps towards a fiscal system that is actually sustainable, because I think most of us will agree that the Eurozone as is, is not really sustainable. So I'll stop there, so not, not to ramble on too much. Brilliant. So uh, each of you has effectively set out some of the much longer term structural trends that uh, the European Union is facing. And I just want to delve into some of those a little bit more because they are, of course, the kind of mood music around all of this and uh it's really they're really what's on the line here in these sort of efforts during the pandemic to try and keep everything together i suppose there has always been this challenging situation for the eu this sense that in times of a crisis it's incredibly poor at being responsive or perhaps even fostering solidarity and i suppose we had that in the early stages of the pandemic there's obviously been a shift in the direction of travel on that and efforts to kind of reel back on those sorts of things but there are as you say longer term structural trends but also many other potential crises that await on the horizon something that strikes me in particular about this is the fact that we were just before the pandemic in a situation where the migration crisis, uh, this theme was uh, rearing its head again. There was obviously this breakdown at the Turkish-Greek um, border. Um, there was a sort of patchwork job, as usual, sort of there to keep things going. But um, certainly, if you look at the longer term structural issues here uh, on climate change and so on, there, there is, of course, this sense that the uh, issue of migration is by no means going to uh, kind of disappear into the ether. Um, Friedrich, how would you, how confident would you be about an EU response to the next migration crisis, whatever form that takes it? Is there something, is there some kind of solidarity or some kind of wake up call that has been experienced during the pandemic about the fragility of the system that would help the EU to be more responsive? Or do you think that we'll have end up with a sort of repeat of um, some of the tensions that have been uh, played out again over, over recent years? It's a difficult question, Sophia. Um, I mean, I, I mean, my, my reading of the situation is that sort of the, you, you can divide up the migration questions in three different issues. So sort of the first one is what happens at the external border? Is there a capacity either by EU institutions or by member state institutions to have uh, a sort of system of controlled migration? Meaning sort of is there a way to stop either migrants coming through Turkey coming into Europe or uh, uh, migrants uh, coming by boat over, uh, over the Mediterranean? Um, and I think sort of there was sort of for, you know, this was in 2015, this was a, an enormously controversial issue uh, between member states, but we had convergence between member states ever since then, uh, 
uh, around the issues about building up stronger common capacities to have a system of controlled migration, meaning uh, we're going to have barbed wires uh, uh, along the European border if that's necessary in order to avoid that mi migrants are going to come uh, uh, in the same fashion as they did in, in, in 2015. So that's the first issue, and I, I, I don't think that convergence sort of has broken down now. The other issues issue is about, so how do we handle migrants that have ended up in refugee camps? And can we find sort of a common ground between member states where uh, countries share the responsibilities for taking care of those, um, especially those in, in Italy and, and Greece? And I think sort of we didn't really find that, uh, uh, that commonality between the member states. Um, uh, and even if sort of the problem has become smaller than it was in, in 2015, 2016, we're basically still at a point where most of the member states uh, won't agree uh, that just because you've entered Italy or Greece that you have a right or you have a sort of that a country has a responsibility to share them uh, or to, sh to share the burden with, with those two countries. Um, yeah, I mean, there has been some positive signs um, um, getting sort of many more bilateral agreements between countries uh, to help sort of uh, shoulder the burdens of of, uh, of the member states. But it's not as if we have sort of a common EU system which everyone buys into. Uh, even if you take out some of the more uh, skeptical countries like Poland and Hungary, um, uh, we don't have. Uh, much of a, of a consensus how to deal with this this particular issue, and then we have the issue about volumes. I mean, how many how many people are are reasonable for uh, the EU as a whole, or for individual member states to uh, to take in if we're confronted with 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 the migration crisis again? And and again, I think there um, there is uh, to the extent that there is a convergence of views it's sort of going towards very low volumes of migrants but i suppose i suppose that if we have a situation like the one we had in 2015 when uh, uh, we had sort of people fleeing from from war zones and people that were sort of badly treated in refugee camps it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for eu member states to just say no or uh, sort of to avoid taking any form of humanitarian responsibility for it. So if, if that happens again, I mean, I, I, I suppose that we'll, we'll find sort of a better climate of collaboration on some issues, but not on others. Interesting. And Georgie, I, one thing that did strike me uh, at the start of the year when this sort of Greek Turkish border situation was uh, all coming to a head was we did see uh, von der Leyen, you know, new in this position coming out trying to sort of uh, demonstrate a break with the approach of the past, very forthright, very defensive focused, saying we're going to secure the external borders, we're going to throw money at this. Um, do you think there has been a fundamental step change in thinking around this issue? It is a lesson that the EU institutions have taken from the migration crisis that they need to demonstrate the value, the protective value of the EU and and its uh, its external borders, and they need to sort of reinforce that. And um, will we start to see conversations around a much more equipped uh, naval defensive system and and so on? Uh, do, do you think that this will be a fundamental part of the EU institution strategy around this issue moving forward? So, you know, I think one of the main problems with the EU institutions is they don't do strategy uh, very well, or, or if they do have a comprehensive strategy, they can't always then think about, okay, well, what, what does that mean in terms of capacity and resources and how do we do our communication? So it's, it's many sort of building blocks that you need. And there's been a lot of trial and error. I think it was certainly one of the big ambitions and it's actually was until recently top of the German presidency's list of priorities that they wanted to look at the issue of migration very closely. Of course, how the German presidency manages to do that when it has you know, an EU seven EU budget, seven year EU budget to conclude this, you know, get agreement on this recovery package for the coronavirus and also, uh, you know, Brexit um, and the future UK EU relationships. So again, it's sort of where does, does migration fit in that? But I think what the migration crisis has shown is not just 
sort of member states disagreeing on how the EU should respond and what power the EU should have, which is what Frederick was talking about, but also um, uh, differences between the different institutions, actually. And you've got sort of the European Commission that wants a strategy, that wants to, you know, this to figure regularly um, in its discussions with member states. And then you have the European Parliament that's completely divided over the issue as well. And that's hampering, I think, um, strategic thinking on that front. Um, where do we go from here? Um, I I, you know, I think at the moment that's just not where the priority is. Um, they're, they're very much focused on on COVID. Then they're going to be focused on finalising discussions on this new EU budget. Um, but I suspect it will come back up in the autumn, particularly if there are. Um, and von der Leyen was very ambitious on this. Um, parts of the budget, the new EU budget, that will be looking at addressing this issue. Um, whether they focus those resources on external borders, you know, trying to show that they are listening to the concerns of EU citizens and responding to that, or whether they focus more of their attention in sort of, you know, third countries, so those transit countries through which um, many um, uh, migrants go through. So again, it's, I think it's too early to say, and there was certainly a lot of ambition at the beginning of the year, but they've been sort of, you know, uh, put to the side as they deal with this pandemic. And Brian, you've obviously done an enormous amount of reporting, particularly about um, the effect that uh, the longer term consequences of the migration crisis have had on national uh, political systems and, and societies and all of the sort of, um, you know, the beyond the crisis story of, of a migration crisis. Uh, in your opinion, do, have you seen any kind of evolution in the thinking around national leaders and how they would respond to another migration crisis is is having sort of seen the way in which these sorts of things can play out and had a better understanding of the short medium term but potentially even longer term kind of structural pressures that it had sort of precipitated on national political systems do you think that we would see national leaders responding in a very different way i certainly think we already have seen a stark difference uh, with what happened earlier this year, just around the time the pandemic was starting. Um, you know, unlike in 2015-16, when you had that sort of welcoming rhetoric, perhaps coming out of Germany or elsewhere, and sort of emphasizing the humanitarian aspects um, of, of the crisis. Now we had a sort of a pretty straightforward uh, um, quick uh, reaction from the Commission, but also from, from the member states, and be it a reaction in terms of their silence or, or, or sort of a support for, for Greece. And, and basically the, the, the tenor was uh, shut the gates and, and send reinforcements, you know, send in the troops and, and, and close the floodgates. So I think uh, uh, that is a striking difference to, to, to at least the sort of the rhetoric of 2015. And obviously, here in Germany, there is um, uh, perpetually an undercurrent of anxiety about another uh, refugee crisis that would see thousands or, or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people pouring into Germany, like what happened uh, back in 2015-16. And I don't think anyone wants for that to happen. So obviously, they do have much more of a resolve, I would say. and and. And the, 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 the language used by uh, Ms. von der Leyen, who, who was the, obviously prior to um, taking up office in, in the Bellamont building in Brussels, she was a uh, defense minister of Germany and she's uh, very close to Angela Merkel. So you saw there was quite a belligerent rhetoric. I mean, she used the word shield and, and defense and so on and so forth. So we haven't really seen that uh, before. But the thing is, uh, you know, th they don't really have a strategy. No, I'm quite sort of intimately acquainted with the thinking of, of a number of European leaders on this, including here in Berlin, and they don't really have a long-term strategy. They're sort of muddling through. But the truth is, uh, the bare truth is, as long as we have a functioning asylum system, there's no resolution to the migration crisis because there's a huge reservoir of people, you know, hundreds of millions of people who are on the move or who will be on the move. The population of Africa is growing um, you know, they have internet, they can see how people live in Europe, they see the opportunities. Uh, and I don't think there is any way to sort of interrupt that current except by sort of some brute force. Uh, 
or by literally abolishing or reducing the right to asylum. Uh, failing to do any of that, it's up to the courts to decide. So essentially anyone who comes to Europe will stay in Europe because there are legal rights and obligations um, as per international uh, agreements and so on. So I don't think there is a strategy. Nobody wants to tamper with those things, except perhaps people like uh, Viktor Orban of Hungary, uh, who, who obviously doesn't have an influence over, over the issue um, uh, outside of his own country. Um, so I think the migration crisis is sort of one of these permanent crises of the European Union. It, it will become a fixture, it has become a fixture of, 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 of political life uh, at, in the chancelleries of Europe. And I think you, you have to view it perhaps a, a little bit like, um, you know, in terms of uh, resolution, in, uh, like the, the climate uh, change crisis. It's not really going to be resolved. We'll see if we can ameliorate the consequences of it. And, you know, handling it is, is for the future moment of crisis. Because, you know, as, as, as I think Georgina said, uh, at the moment, they're not really doing much. They're looking at the budget. They're looking at the at the COVID-19 epidemic and the economic consequences of it. They're looking at China, they're looking at the United States. Uh, you know, they deal with the issues at hand. And, and especially in Germany, Angela Merkel's style of politics is to deal with the issues that are on the agenda today. You know, they're not going to look uh, in what happens six months from now, let alone, you know. So I, I, don't, think, I don't think there's a res resolution. I don't think there's a strategy. I don't think there will be a strategy because for the reasons I, I listed, so I think they will deal, deal with it uh, the same way they deal with, um, with uh, you know, the challenge of, of the climate change. And things might change when the Green Party gets into government in Germany, which is, I think, inevitable. And then we'll perhaps see a, a shift in politics, but uh, that's, you know, that's for the future. So let's pick up on this topic. Uh, you mentioned climate change just at the end there. Um, I'm very interested in moving to thinking about the EU as a kind of global actor. Um, Friedrich, how much, I mean, we know that when, you know, this new commission came uh, into fruition, it's, it, climate change has been uh, embedded as an, an, as an incredibly strong part of its mission. Uh, we know that this is an area that is becoming increasingly prominent in the national dynamics within the member states as well. Um, what does it actually mean for the EU to start to think of itself as a global actor? And particularly uh, in light of the book that you're writing at the moment, I'm interested in your thoughts around um, what role that you would, would see itself playing within a liberal or Western alliance as a global actor on the world stage there, speaking with one voice. Yeah, um, I mean, on, on climate change, I think, I think it's notable that when you look at <clears throat> Um, the, the Commission now, and when you look at what um, some of the more powerful member states are saying, if there is something from the pre-pandemic agenda that they're going to uh, they're going to protect or they're going to sort of keep it um, on the agenda after the pandemic, it is the Green New Deal. Um, and sort of when you start to go into issues around how this new recovery fund is going to be spent. Um, uh, you can see that a lot of the more forward thinking that exists on what would you do sort of if you suddenly were given a lot more money than you usually have, uh, uh, a good portion of that is planned to be spent sort of on, on different sort of projects which is going to uh, help European countries to, uh, to meet the climate targets. Um, so I think, you know, this is, this is going to be a, a strong agenda for the EU. It's also going to be an agenda where they trying to keep up an international profile, uh, partly because also there are lots of member states, not least France, that you know, takes uh, a very strong view on, on making sure that the Paris Agreement is going to, um, is going to be maintained. Um, but I think climate change is, in that sense, different from many other issues in the sense that on, on many other international issues, it's difficult to find sort of a strong commonality between member states about what they actually want to achieve. Um, if it's on trade, um, if it's on, on security matters, uh, there tend to be not just sort of substantive differences between member states, but they also have different um, 
they make sort of a different analysis about how urgent um, some issues are. Um, now, given the confrontation, for instance, on trade and security between United States and, and Europe, you'll find that for some countries, this is, this is a big deal and they are willing sort of to sacrifice a lot in order to maintain a transatlantic alliance, while other member states, they are sort of looking for other different options and don't think that this matter that much, partly because they, they may have a security situation themselves that, that aren't um, uh, very problematic or because they don't feel that trade with America in itself is giving much of an economic contribution uh, to them. Um, so there are sort of differences there. And again, I mean, I think we sort of coming back to, this, it's an old story about, about the EU, which is that to the extent it has the capacity to be a large player in international affairs, it will be so in areas where there is sort of a strong uh, centralization of policies in Europe. Uh, in the past, it was usually trade. I mean, one of few areas where the EU actually could act as an own institution uh, internationally. Um, and the Commission itself is trying to protect that role, even if, even if they struggle sort of to come up with uh, a good description about exactly what that role would be or will be in the future, given problems that we're having with America, problems with China, et cetera, on, 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 on these fronts. Um, given the problems we have with deepening the single market in Europe, especially on digital matters and services, that also leads to problems for the EU to actually be a part in more advanced forms of, of trade discussions uh, in, in, in the world, simply because the EU itself doesn't have the power to agree on anything. It's, it's up to the member states to do that. But the old story is basically that for the EU to play a role internationally, there has first to be sort of a, a, a move of policies and competence to Brussels. And if that move hasn't happened, it's going to be very, very difficult for the EU to speak with one voice. And I think that's, that's still one of the problems that um, um, Joseph Borrell or many others are being confronted with, which is that when they are confronted with uh, an international situation or event that requires a response from Europe, they first need to go in and negotiate between the member states to come up with the response before they go into act. And, and that, of course, uh, makes it a bit more problematic uh, for the EU sort of to be more of a, uh, a forceful actor in, in global politics. Interesting. Georgie, you said where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, do you see a growing confidence and a growing political will for the EU to be taking a much stronger role, I suppose, in, in, in the West? Do they see do, uh, the United States sort of retreat from some of these institutions and, and from its traditional role as the kind of anchor in the Western liberal alliance? Do they see that as an opportunity um, or are they quite fearful about the consequences of needing to take a more active global role? Um, I mean, it's a good question and it probably depends on the policy area. So I think, you know, the, clearly the EU believes in, uh, you know, rules-based international order. Um, it's been uh, one of the number one priorities of this new commission has been to, you know, strengthen the trade system to so the WTO system, um, try and, you know, um, continue to keep that green agenda right at the top of the priorities. So not only the EU's priority, but in its relations with other countries. I mean, Germany, uh, again, wanted as part of its presidency to organize an EU-China summit, where it would be amongst many other things, looking at uh, the issue of climate. So I think where the EU feels it has the capacity to speak um, internationally and where it feels like member states are rallying behind it, then it has been, I think, uh, forceful. Um, but again, there are lots of other areas where the EU has very little limited role or member states simply cannot agree on what the EU should do. And then that's why you always have this definition of, you know, the EU being an economic giant, um, but a, a, a sort of economic giant, um, political, uh, what was it? So now I shouldn't use these expressions without remembering them. Economic giant, political, uh, and military worm. Whoever knows can get, come in. But basically, it is incredibly active and powerful in the economic sphere, but not so much in other areas. Um, but coming back to your, I think, um, question on climate, 
Um, I completely agree with Frederick that um, the discussion really, particularly in light of the pandemic, hasn't been whether the EU should do something, but how it should do it. Um, and it's been most prominent, I think, in the EU's discussions around trade and what environmental component there can be in any future existing and future trade deals and that's not just uh, given the negotiations with the UK it's pretty much with any negotiations it's having with third countries um, and so it's really this idea of how can you what does a green trade deal look like? We know that the Department for, for International Trade, DG Trade, has set up a whole team that's going to be looking at monitoring this um, in, in the EU's existing uh, trade deals, making sure that actually, is there a way that you can make market access conditional on respecting these environmental um, and social norms? Um, and I think the second big point on, on climate change and the green agenda is, is member states don't want to have to give more money to the EU. They want the EU to spend this money effectively. So there's going to be lots of questions about how do you think of efficient spending? Where do you prioritise your resources? And how can you do much more with basically the same or, or less, particularly now that member states have agreed that they're going to have to give more if there's a recovery package for Corona. They really don't want to have to give even more. So I think there's going to be lots of discussions on smart spending I think, over the coming months. And I'm going to look up that expression so that when I come back, I can say it to you. <laughs> um, Boyan, I'm really interested in your thoughts about the EU as a global actor, but I'm also interested in your thoughts around the issue of climate change and its potency. Um, how do you see this fitting within the structure of these other types of anti movements that have been incredibly prominent in Europe over recent years? We've obviously had this huge push of populism. There's been this kind of backlash against social change and the kind of liberal doctrine. Um, how do you see the climate change agenda fitting within that? Is this actually just an expression of one other part of the polarization that is gripping Europe, or is it somehow something distinct? Mm, sorry, Sophie, there was a bit of a disturbance in the audio. Did, did you mention the, the climate movement, the sort of the, the Fridays for Future and stuff like that? Was that what you're referring to? So I'm interested to hear how you think that the climate change movement and, mm. and this huge kind of body of energy behind that fits in with some of the other social movements um, and kind of anti-establishment politics that we've seen over recent years. Uh, do you see that as just one half of the other side of the polarization or is this actually something distinct that will be as transformative as these kind of um, populist movements concerned about the progress of social change? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, first, to, you know, to answer the, the, the initial question about um, whether the EU can be a global actor, and this question itself is sort of elicits a, a, a wary smile. Uh, I had dinner the other day with a very senior German diplomat who, who was saying how, how the External Action Service, which is the foreign office of the European Union, is a completely useless uh, organization and does really little and uh, amounts not to much. And I think we'll leave it at that. I mean, that's obviously his assessment, but he's been in the business for four years. And I think, you know, by the nature of the dynamic between the, the nation states that make up the European Union, it's, it's rather difficult to speak in one voice forcefully in terms of diplomacy, in terms of foreign uh, policy, in terms of defense, security. It's very, it's very, very difficult. Sometimes, obviously, these interests converge, but um, not very often, actually. And, and France and Germany uh, have fundamentally different interests in, 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 on many occasions. I mean, if you look at Libya, which is, which is one basically uh, very uh, perhaps uh, pertinent example of, of how European foreign policy is struggling, you know, Libya, it's, it's in everyone's interest to pacify Libya. And, and obviously, they, you know, they back different sides in the whole. Uh, conflict. And if you look at the, the uh, Western Balkans, if you look at North Macedonia, a country I know well because I was born there, uh, it's, it's very interesting how, how uh, Chancellor Merkel thinks that it's, it's quite relevant for North Macedonia to be uh, engage in, in, in membership talks. And she even traveled all the way down there to support the government efforts 
And then you've got uh, President Macron who, who blocked the whole thing and, and put a number of issues uh, around it and conditions and so on and so forth. So not even in their own backyard, they are able to speak in one voice. In the end, they found the sort of a, they muddled through as, as they always do, but it, it's rather difficult. And, uh, and, and as, for, as, as, as for the more interesting question of, 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 the, of the climate uh, change movement or, or, or the sort of the movements that emerge from that anxiety about this sort of looming disaster of climate change, um, I think there is, a, there is an enormous energy uh, which has not been claimed uh, on the political spectrum. In Germany, it's claimed by the Green Party. It's kind of natural. But... Uh, but these are not, uh, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not clear who can claim these voters because they're looking for policy. They're quite savvy, these young people. I, I, I sort of spoken to some of them and I, I see them on television here. And, and uh, you know, they won't be, you know, they're very apolitical in, in, the, in the classical party political sense. So there's an enormous reservoir of energy. They're able to mobilize literally tens or hundreds of thousands of people in this country alone to go out on the street. And, and I think they will perhaps be transformative uh, in, in an election uh, setup, but we'll have to wait and see what happens and which way they go, because uh, I, don't, I don't think they are, they're putting their bets necessarily on, a, on an environmentalist party if, if the party doesn't deliver policy. They actually look into policies. You know, if you, if you look at Greta, the sort of figurehead of, of that youth movement, she, you know, she may be 16 or 17, but she, sort of, she has a bullet point of policies that she sort of keeps uh, imposing uh, in speeches on on the listeners on which are often the kind of heads and heads of states and governments and and so on, and uh, it will be interesting to see who harnesses this energy, because uh, you know one one assumes they are sort of left liberal and and green and environmentalist, but but who knows? You know, I had an interesting conversation with Steve Bannon about this, and he told me he told me Macron will be a fool not to you know claim these voters for him. But he kind of also sounded like these voters could be claimed uh, also for his uh, own uh, political sort of thinking. So it's, it's quite interesting. I, th I think they, they, they have exercised enormous pressure on policymaking, certainly in this country they have. And they have, uh, you know, prior to the epidemic, of course, now everything is put on ice during the sort of handling of the um, pandemic. But prior to the pandemic, uh, you know, you had uh, Chancellor Merkel and her coalition partners sort of scrambling to hold meetings to respond to the demands of these hundreds of thousands of people, which were marching every marching every Friday. And it's 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 a huge movement. It's in, in numbers they are certainly bigger than the populist movements because the populists kind of really are not also decided for one party, so they can't be claimed similarly. Uh, but, you know, these guys, they are very mobile, they're very digital, they're very media savvy, they're very savvy about politics, i.e. they're very skeptical and cynical. So they could turn out to be, a, you know, they could be partially a dis destructive force for the mainstream, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, all bats are off. It, it will be an interesting development. But I think they put the fear in God into, into mainstream politicians uh, in this country and, and, and around Europe, I think. And if, if you people like Steve Bannon, are you know carefully listening and looking into this whole thing i mean there there is some potential in it yeah so i'm looking at, we've got a whole bunch of questions from the audience and and we've had a bunch uh emailed through as well uh it will probably not surprise you that many of them are about foreign policy and particularly the eu's relations on you know with some of these strategic rivals as we may um describe them uh let's start with russia Friedrich, <laughs> um, do you see the EU moving closer together or maintaining this kind of degree of friction that it has on policy towards Russia? We've obviously seen a big uh, new push to disrupt the Nord Stream 2 project. Um, I think the, the fact that uh, Germany itself has often been the one trying to take a more um, sort of pragmatic economic approach uh, in its engagement with Russia has certainly complicated things. Um, what do you see as the direction of travel in, in the EU relationship with Russia? And uh, particularly in light of probably, I suppose it's always relevant to think of that as well within the context of the transatlantic relationship and, and how that's expressed through the EU's relationship with Russia. Yeah, no, I mean, sort of, uh, I'm afraid it doesn't get any easier if you throw America into the mix as well, because that's, that's become sort of even more complicating factor. 
Uh, I mean, sort of generally speaking, I, I think there is, a, there is a big difference between member states in how, sort of how much they are fearing Russia. Um, it's one thing if you are Estonia or Finland, or even my mother country, Sweden, uh, compared to if you're Portugal or Spain, which, and you don't, you don't share a border with Russia. You, you, you're not confronted with uh, Russian MiGs that are sort of um, disturbing your, um, uh, your, your, your borders sort of every second week or so. So I think that's, that's in, in the first place, is, is a difference. The other is on the economic side, where it's obvious that some countries have deeper economic ties with Russia than others. We saw that over the second Nord Stream, um, where a number of the sort of the big uh, energy champions in, in Germany, uh, they weren't shy at all uh, um, about sort of towing a line, which was extraordinarily uh, Kremlin friendly, um, and sort of helping them to make their case towards uh, member states' governments and also in Brussels. I mean, it's, it's sometimes you have to sort of pinch yourself in the arm uh, just to make sure that you're awake when you listen to what some of these uh, energy companies are, are actually saying when it comes to sort of the broad strategic direction of the EU and its relation to Russia. Um, for the time being, uh, and we've seen this for a number of years now, that the... Uh, that difference itself hasn't uh, isn't sort of it isn't changing status quo very much. Um, everyone seems okay with rolling over the sanctions and and postponing sort of any sort of discussion into the future uh, about um, what the European Union thinks uh, it can do with Russia, um, whether it's it's going to you know begin to um, sort of open up conversations with Russia on perhaps economic matters a little bit more, um, uh, how they're going to view the situation in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. Um, I mean, for the time being, most of these conversations are not being held. And ev every time that the sanctions are going to roll over, you can see that there is increased the diplomatic activity between the member states and, you know, just to make sure uh, that, that these policies are going to uh, remain in place. But um, but I think this, this may sort of come down to um, some of the uh, points that have been made by, uh, by Georgina and, and Bojan uh, before, which is that the EU itself isn't really in a position uh, where it can outline a broad future strategy for itself. It can, you know, it can talk the talk, it can describe itself as being a, a, a liberal force for human rights, for openness, for democracy, for civil liberties, for sort of free trade in the world. But when it comes to the practice, it's, it's, it's always confronted with so many, uh, so many challenges that will hinder uh, swift and, and decisive action for the EU. So I, I really don't see anything changing anytime soon vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Georgie, we've received some very helpful uh, uh, inputs regarding that phrase you were trying to recall. I know what it is as well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, an economic giant, a political dwarf, and a military worm. So, right. there we go. Um, where do you see the direction of travel on the relationship with Russia? And I'm particularly interested in your views about President Macron's very esoteric efforts to try and uh, bring Russia to the table um, and, and how successful you think uh, that approach might be. Yeah, so an um, excellent question, and thank you for the clarification. I had since checked on my on my phone, and it was coined by a Belgian diplomat at the time, who apparently was frustrated by some of the lack of opportunities the EU um, wasn't able to seize because member states couldn't agree on anything more than the economics. Anyway, coming back to your question, I think you know when we're talking about Russia, it's really important to remember that Russia doesn't seem to have an EU policy either. So it's not just that the EU doesn't know instantly what it's trying to do. Um, you know, we, we sort of get a sense of what Russia is trying to do in, in, in the EU and sort of particularly try and perhaps divide um, member states um, and, and try and create divisions there. But actually, it doesn't, it's not immediately clear what its own EU policy is. And, and you sense that with Russia shifting as well um, and sort of prioritizing prioritizing this Eurasia group and, and trying to strengthen relations with China as well. Um, so I think that's really important to remember, whereas uh, in the early 2000s, clearly Russia did have a new policy, um, which was looking to deepen relations on a, you know, an equal footing. So the soft, you know, 
we each respect our sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other big axis, of course, when it comes to Russia is around disinformation. So I think just uh, last week you had four member states, I think it was Estonia, Slovakia, uh latvia i bit no so yeah estonia lithuania latvia and stuff who came out and said you know disinformation is a real concern for us published a non-paper and the eas um so the which i said the eu sort of de facto foreign ministries decided to take that up and to be looking at it and they weren't specific about which countries but presumably russia figures on that as well um on macron i think macron's russian policy is basically a french policy approach to Russia, it's always been about you strategically engage uh, with Russia because you have to, because Russia's on your doorstep, because there are a number of reasons why member states are, you know, economically entwined with uh, with Russia, particularly dependent on for certain resources. So there is always a sense that you have to keep that that door open, um, and you need to keep the conversation going. Um, I think it has annoyed certain member states because it felt like it was slightly at odds with everything else that Macron was saying, which is it's not about France. This is all about the EU, and this is a moment for the EU. And then certain member states were saying, well, you appear to be having this ongoing dialogue with Russia and we don't really feel like you're you're sort of making that to me you think it's very much a French uh, decision to go ahead and so I think that did ruffle some feathers um, that being said I think Macron's been quite stern uh, and you know when Putin was in France and they had that conference there were some really uncomfortable moments where clearly Macron was was critiquing the Russian government um, in front of the Russian president so I think overall um, France's position towards Russia won't change um, it's not going to just abandon the its bilateral uh, relationship that it's invested a lot in um, just so that it can hide behind the EU banner. Um, but it will be interesting to see moving, you know, as, as the EU kind of takes, thinks more constructively about its foreign policy, where different member states um, sit, not only on Russia, but on other issues as well, where they've already got a clear idea of what they're trying to achieve. So can you imagine Germany shifting its position at all on this. I mean, they they have ruffled many feathers with uh, their sort of uh, this deeply pragmatic uh, strategic engagement approach, uh, distinct from Macron's own efforts, but um, definitely grounded, particularly in, in an economic sphere. Do you think, are you optimistic about the direction of travel here? And, and do you think Nord Stream 2 will go ahead? Yes, well, German policy is pragmatic when it comes to their economic interest as, as a country, um, less so when it doesn't. Uh, essentially, they are uh, pulling out all the stops for, for Nord Stream 2. It's a little bit out of their hands now, in fact, because it's up to the Russians to complete the pipeline. I think there are like less than 100, km, around 100 kilometers, perhaps less that needs to be that need to be finished and the americans have obviously put sanctions on the companies that were building the pipelines they weren't able to finish it now russia uh, the gazprom the sort of state controlled company has uh, dispatched its own ships which are slightly inadequate so it will take a lot of time it would appear and while they're doing it in Congress, uh, there is another round of sanctions uh, brewing, so which could perhaps even delay it even further. So it's out of their hands. The Germans want it finished. They will not renounce it, not this government, perhaps not even the next one, but we shall see because if the Greens are in government and depends on what position they, they assume in the future coalition, things might change in terms of these strategic determinations. But uh, Germany stands firmly behind uh, Nord Stream 2. It stands firmly behind its relationship with Russia the way it is. Uh, Chancellor Merkel has been instrumental in, in bringing Europe together uh, in terms of the sanctions following the invasion of Ukraine in 2014, but uh, she has never uh, abandoned um, the um, economic policy of, of Germany uh, in terms of cooperating with Russia, and, and she speaks I think she's the world leader who speaks with uh, Vladimir Putin the most, uh, from what I'm told. They, 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 we would be surprised how often. So sometimes they speak every two weeks or every every week. So um, I, I do think, obviously, uh, as, as Georgina said, the, the French policy towards Russia is the French policy towards Russia as ever. Uh, you know, someone might remember that even under President Hollande, uh, uh, there was a 
immediately after the, the Russia intervened in Ukraine, um, France was meant to dispatch two hugely expensive, sophisticated warships. <laughs> And President Hollande at the time was really, he, he didn't really want to cancel the deal, but in, in the end he had to, or, or they found a way how to do it. But, uh, you know, history sort of repeats itself. I, I do think things are becoming, uh, they're, you know, more flexible given the uh, sort of American hostility towards all things European. So you are having a split, you are seeing a split in the transatlantic posture towards Russia. And I think that's for, that's a fact. I mean, last week alone, um, President Trump decided to pull 10,000 troops, 9,500 troops out of Germany. Some of these troops, perhaps one to 1,000 will go to Poland, but the rest of them will go home. So, uh, you know, that's, that's presumably quite a joyful piece of news for, for President Putin. Um, we shall see, but I think, I think, uh, on the whole, Chancellor Merkel is extremely flexible on this and every other issue under the sun. And I think there, there is a slight misconception in, in, in sort of in the global punditry that this Nord Stream 2 uh, thing was uh, imposed on her and it was a project by her coalition partner and she sort of inherited it and whatnot, but that's not really true. Uh, this is a German project. The German establishment as it is now in government is, is fully behind that. And I think, uh, going forward uh, we, we might see uh, we might see sort of the relationship improving a little bit perhaps in in other in other especially since now we are entering a a stage of a severe and unexpected recession so we have a whole bunch of questions about china as you can probably imagine but i thought we might have a pause on some of those kinds of questions and have a little foray back into uh, the joyous topic of Brexit, because we also have a bunch of questions about that. Um, and we haven't really spoken that much about Brexit. Uh, so I think that the tone of many of the questions uh, is really, what does the UK leaving, and I suppose we're already witnessing some of this, but how does it shift the dynamics within the European Union, certainly shifts the dynamics of budgetary power and, and influence, but there's also, I think, something that is probably poor, less well understood uh, in Westminster is, is, is the very specific kind of constructive role, I suppose, that, that the UK was playing on, on, on actually driving forward a number of issues. Um, so how does the UK's departure affect the structural dynamics the psyche, the mood music of the European Union, and are there actually any kinds of projects or initiatives that will be opening up on the other side um, now the UK uh, is almost certainly going to be out the door? Uh, Friedrich. I mean, I think the, the recovery fund that we started to talk about, I think that is a clear example of something that wouldn't happen if the UK had been a member. Um, because so Angela Merkel as well as Emmanuel Macron would have sort of drawn the conclusion immediately that it's just impossible to get through uh, a budget expansion of this size um, um, when sort of uh, you have a, a, a member like the UK which is outside the euro. Now it's easier to deal with the non-euro countries uh, because they tend to be sort of smaller and less influential. Um, and these non-euro uh, countries also know that they are smaller and less influential, which means that they are uh, now sort of pressured in, 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 in a way that they simply wouldn't be um, if, if the UK still had been uh, in the EU. Um, I mean, quite often you, you will hear that uh, the UK's departure is changing uh, EU commercial policy, especially trade policy, and to some extent, single market policies. And I think that's true, but it's only up to point. I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean when, you, when you look back over the last five, six years, it is difficult to find sort of any issue uh, on commercial policy where the UK was in a driving force, where it initiated something and then uh, was putting a lot of power uh, behind the initiative itself. Uh, 
um, I mean, having been in Brussels since 2004, I mean, one of the things that have struck me the most is how often the UK simply has been sitting on the fence on many of the issues that uh, generally have been seen as sort of the issues that the UK cared a lot about, like trade and single market reforms. Um, and I mean, my, my reading of, of sort of British politics was, you know, basically that you know, several UK governments in the past gradually lost interest or patience with the EU and uh, simply didn't spend all that political energy that was needed in order to get things done. Um, you know, when it comes to votes uh, in, in the Council on trade agreements or sort of broader type of single market reforms, um, the UK was important, but it's not that it's, it's, it was necessary in order to get things, to get things through. So when you have a trade deal being uh, presented to the council, you, you know already that it's going to go through simply because they work on the principle of, principle of uh, unanimity uh, on all trade issues, even if it has the competence to push things through with qualified majorities. I think on, on foreign policy, that may be sort of one of the areas where uh, Britain will be sort of will be missed more than it will be missed sort of in in commercial policies in the sense that UK tended to have tend to have a foreign policy and a pretty coherent foreign policy uh, it had uh, expertise knowledge uh, not least sort of when foreign policy venture into areas of security cyber security uh, military capacities um, in cybersecurity, I mean, when Britain left, you, you basically took away a substantial part of all the expertise in Europe when it comes to um, cybersecurity defense. So, and, and that's, that's missing now. And, and you, you, you could certainly see that there's been a sort of change in the quality of the discussion as a consequence of that. Um, I think also Britain had the capacity to uh, sort of, you know, perhaps push Germany a little bit more into the corner than, uh, than uh, is the case now because uh, on, on foreign policy, Britain was pretty skillful in, in building alliances with France and a few other countries, uh, which made it sort of far more difficult for Germany to take its normal position um, in, in, in sort of most foreign policies, which is either that it becomes extraordinary mercantilistic, that, it, that they still want to sort of sell their, you know, electrical goods and the cars, um, or that it becomes um, human rights oriented to the degree sort of where it just becomes impossible to do anything because they are not willing to uh, make a hard decision uh, where you will need to perhaps also sacrifice some of your, uh, some of your uh, more sort of abstract uh, ideals. So th th I think sort of Britain is going to be missed there and it's going to be missed by many other countries as well uh, when it comes to foreign policy, uh, but less so I think on, on trade, commercial policy. I mean, sort of, you know, if, if I look back at some of the more tougher fights that we had on commercial policy over the past 10, 15 years, Britain was quite often on the other side of the argument, uh, whether, whether that's going to be sort of on on sort of excessive regulation on climate, consumer rights, or if it was sort of... Uh, uh, an almost uh, 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 sort of ideological uh, sort of ho sort of almost hostile position against bilateral trade deals because it wants to defend the World Trade Organization um, and and sort of the sanctity of multilateral rules. Um, so, I mean, Euro Europe is going to survive without without Britain on commercial policies, but it's going to be sort of less of an influential actor in the world without it. Fascinating. Georgie, how do you see uh, Britain's Roger, you're obviously working on this every single day. Uh, <laughs> obviously in the UK uh, and you're now in Brussels at the moment uh, and very much you've always in your work tried to bring the other side in things. What do you think are the biggest areas that the UK will be missed in and, and what are some of the opportunities? Where does it open up a, a new kind of opportunity for the EU to work productively together? So I guess it's really important to remember the context. So at the time of the referendum and when the referendum result came out, there was real thinking in Brussels about how the EU could deepen and broaden its relations with neighbouring states. And so to a certain extent, when the referendum happened, you know, most people were sort of 
you know, shocked and, and, and upset and obviously uh, really disappointed with the result. But there was kind of a small contingency of people, particularly in the EU institutions, thinking, right, how are we going to work with the UK constructively going forward? The problem is, is that it was only within the limits of how they think now. So it was basically, how do you slot the UK into the way that we do things and then build from that? Whereas of course the UK government was clear from the start, that's not good enough for us. We want something completely different. Um, and then the way that the negotiations evolved, particularly the tone at times that was very confrontational, I think that really sapped any energy out of thinking constructively about how the UK and the EU could uh, cooperate in the future. Um, and and I think for, for, for the EU now, particularly member states, there's a key question of how do you protect the autonomy of your decision making? So basically preventing the UK telling you what to do, because a few, uh, you know, a couple of, of, of member state diplomats have said this to me in the past, but one of them said, you know, feels like when the UK is in the room, it's telling us what to do. Now it's out of the room, it still wants to tell us what to do. And so, you know, how do you sort of prevent that from happening? But also how do you think strategically about EU, the Europe's autonomy, because if you're going to think strategically about that, you're going to have to work with the UK. Um, and then I think there is kind of within foreign ministries now, a sense of, okay, if the UK leaves the transition period with no deal, what does that mean for, um, hello? Oh yeah, fine. What does that mean for the, um, you know, UK and the EU's positions on things like China, on Russia, and on the United States as well? Um, and so there are foreign ministries are now thinking very, very seriously about, look, whatever happens with these negotiations, we're going to have to think about how we're going to cooperate with the UK on foreign policy. But I would argue that they're at the very early stages of their thinking, and that's the EU side rather than what's happening in the UK. Boyan, what obviously uh, the the tears have all dried up now. Um, there's no any kind of wishful thinking about the UK coming back. How do you see the momentum about thinking about a post UK world? And are are there still optimists pushing to say, okay, this is the big break that we need to do X and X and X, um, or or is has I mean, really, has the pandemic as well just also kind of in bringing another crisis to the front sort of consumed all the space for those bigger kind of conversations? Well, look, I think that the primary question here that, that everyone's concerned about is, is what happens, what kind of deal will they get uh, leaving the European Union? Because what, what is most important to everyone involved is the single market. Again, that, that is the European Union. There's very little beyond the single market or the, or the Eurozone. And, and um, if Britain leaves uh, on hostile terms and perhaps without an agreement even, which, which I still can't imagine would be the case, but you, know, you never know, and, and it's, it's, it's certainly not unlikely, um, then that's a bit of a disaster, obviously. I mean, uh, Germany exports humongous amounts of, of, of um, products to uh, not just cars, but everything to the United Kingdom. And, and that would be rather disastrous, especially now when you have this sort of COVID-induced recession, which, which is pretty acute, actually, and threatens to become chronic, perhaps. And then you add a layer of another, uh, you know, you push the, re the recession curve even further down because the German economists had calculated a long time ago that a hostile Brexit would push Germany into a recession. This was already true last year, early last year even. So uh, it, that's pretty dire. That's pretty bad prospect for everyone, uh, certainly for Britain, but for all of its partners, especially the countries that have a substantial trade relationship uh, with the Brits. That's the primary issue, and I think that's where minds will be focused. Beyond that, once you know, once they actually leave, and 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 when we start thinking about geopolitics and 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 geostrategy and foreign policy and security policy, I think actually not much will change in that regard because we're seeing now, you know, uh, President Trump uh, wanted to convene a. Um, G7 summit in Camp David uh, this summer, and he also wants to invite uh, Russia back to the table. Now, what happens is obviously uh, Boris Johnson is uh, in, in the G7 group, and, and President Macron and Chancellor Merkel uh, obviously had to speak to him. 
and sort out a common strategy about what they're doing about this. Uh, Macron is perhaps not that opposed to bringing in uh, Putin. Uh, um, Merkel is not entirely comfortable with it. And, and Boris Johnson, after what happened with the Scripple affair, obviously is totally against it. So he's aligned with the Germans on this and on many other issues. You know, and now we're, they canceled the China summit, which was due to take place in Germany during the German presidency. But um, they do coordinate on these issues. They do talk about Huawei. Uh, they do talk about cybersecurity. They do talk about all sorts of things. So I think going forward, it will not be, you know, that gap will be a bridge with ad hoc convergence of interests, with ad hoc initiatives, with ad hoc deals. You know, the French, when they actually need something to get moving involving, you know, hard military hardware or any sort of thing, they obviously they're not going to call the Germans, they're going to call the Brits, irrespective of the European Union membership. And, and we have seen that actually in, in the European systems, uh, in rudimentary such as they are for, for tackling the initial phase of the of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, they did involve the, the, the United Kingdom. I mean, perhaps uh, the government of Boris Johnson didn't really take advantage of that involvement, but the door was wide open and there was no sense of being shut out uh, or anything like that. And I think this will continue in the future. There will be ad hoc alliances of interest and uh, actually there won't be in that sense it will be not too different from what we've uh, known during their membership but first we need to resolve the question of the single market I mean, what is britain doing and on what terms will britain be trading with the european union i think uh, uh, once that's decided a lot of things will become much more clear okay so we're rapidly running out of time so a final question with two parts and please feel free to answer both or, or one if you'd rather. Uh, these are two very common themes that we're picking up through all, all the uh, questions coming in. The first is China. This is the fundamental foreign policy uh, paradigm at the moment. How are you going to evolve, evolve the position on China um, and how would it seek to express that? And the other big question is name. Um, and I suppose with, there's quite a few questions about uh, Germany's uh, role in NATO. And uh, there's also questions about the potential for a European army as well, uh, which is a, a topic that never seems to go away. So future of relationship with uh, China, and also this question about the very particular dynamics in NATO that the EU is, is, is playing into. So Friedrich, let's start with you. All right, I, I don't think I heard sort of the first question properly because the, the sound was cracking up, um, but I, I gather it's about sort of um, what is Europe going to do vis-a-vis um, -vis China, right? All right. So, um, I, I mean, Europe is trying to find its own niche way of dealing with China. Um, uh, and for Europe, it's, it's mostly a matter of commercial policy. I mean, Europe's strategic uh, presence in, in, in East Asia or Southeast Asia is, is, is not very substantial, even if there are um, uh, everything from sort of French battleships and, and, and others there. Uh, it's not that Europe has a big strategic stake in the region itself. Um, so it's, it's mostly commercial. It doesn't want to um, follow the American example of taking a very confrontational approach to China by sort of going into trade war uh, in the belief that if you, um, if you do that, you're more likely to sort of squeeze market access out of, of, of Beijing. Um, so they're not going to do that, but nor do they have sort of a more constructive agenda for engagement either. Europe has been, for years now, been trying to negotiate a bilateral investment treaty with China, a treaty that would include sort of a lot of market access reform on services, but that's just been going nowhere um, for the last couple of years, and no one really thinks that, uh, that, that um, uh, it will move in the next couple of years either. Most of the policies uh, with regard to China that it's, it's de being developed in Brussels or in member states uh, uh, are sort of actively looking at instruments to avoid 
uh, China to take up a larger economic role in Europe, uh, whether it's going to be foreign investment screening, uh, if it sort of comes to uh, the point in the strategic sectors where uh, no margin, merger acquisitions can take place when there are Chinese involvement, um, uh, whether it's sort of cyber, special cybersecurity defenses that are being developed, it's, it's predominantly a policy which is vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Um, so there is sort of a soft creeping development where Europe is looking for ways to avoid getting more dependent on, on the Chinese economy and perhaps even looking for ways to uh, decouple a bit from, from, from China in economic terms. But, but it's unlikely it's going to sort of move uh, strongly in that direction because uh, the reliance on China in terms of exports and sales is simply too big. There are too many uh, European investments in China uh, for European authorities to begin to, uh, to work with highly confrontational policies. What we're seeing sort of is more of a market-led development is that Europe is beginning to disengage with China. Uh, we had sort of a rapid growth in, in trade and investments with China beginning in the early 2000s, which was sort of pretty predominant in sort of light electronics, computer uh, components, uh, that sort of thing. And, and that remains, uh, I mean, we do a lot of trade still uh, in these type of sectors. But when it comes to more high sort of value added, and especially more strategic sectors, you will find that, that we are pretty far away from having a very deep form of, of integration with China and that many companies are rather uh, sort of avoiding uh, exposing themselves to uh, many of the risks that come with operating in China. Um, and we're also beginning to see sort of a, 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 a more of a hesitancy on the part of Huawei and other companies to expose themselves to to, more, to much risk in Europe. I mean, they know they know that they will be able sort of to play around with European governments for another while and getting contracts here, but they also know that at some point it's, it's just going to be a no and uh, there will sort of not be big opportunities for Huawei or other telecom equipment companies to, to expand much in Europe. So they are also beginning to be wary uh, about the consequences of of investing too much in the relation there. So there has been sort of, in that sense, more of a market-led sort of disengagement type of development. And I, I would assume that one is going to continue um, with uh, much less sort of reliance on, on strategic technology transfers, uh, cooperation between, between the two sides with a lot more restrictions on investments in sectors where there is any shred of uh, a security component to it. So uh, in, the, in, in, in that sense, I mean, I'm not saying sort of that the problem is, is getting smaller um, by this particular development, but, but I think that's the more realistic scenario that we're looking at, that Europe, Europe's process for dealing with China would mostly sort of happen on sort of corporate side rather than on government side. Interesting. We've obviously now got a very live <laughs> debate in the UK about uh, our relations with China. It's very much at a kind of geopolitical level, but it's also now there are these uh, new projects like Project Defend about stripping uh, China run companies out of much of our uh, supply chains and, and also trying to define what our critical infrastructure is. And I suppose that's a process that may well be uh, replicated in, in various member states in the EU and, and also the institutions themselves. Uh, there was a new report just published uh, yesterday uh, out of Italy that uh, was trying to shine light on the role that Chinese disinformation had been playing um, in Italy during the pandemic as well. So uh, there is, uh, there does seem to be a sort of growing sense that um, that we need to start thinking about China also as a, as a potentially hostile external actor as well. Um, Georgie, where do, where do you see the commissions coming to this? And of course, any quick thoughts about um, the NATO question as well, if you want to come in on that in these last few minutes. I mean, I, I broadly agree with 
Fredericks, I won't sort of spend too much time on this, other than, you know, the EU's approach to China has been very peaceful. It's, you know, it's had an economic dialogue, it's had a human rights dialogue, it's had, you know, and it's tried to separate those. Um, and, you know, and I think it's, again, important to see how China's interacted with the EU. So China's been very keen to um, enhance its sort of bilateral relations with the individual member states or groups of member states. I mean, there's the 17 plus one, you know, 17 Central and Eastern, mostly Central and Eastern European countries and China coming together talking about lots of issues um, but again sort of how the EU reacted to that and particularly the big member states thinking well is this something we should encourage or is it something that we we should actually come together and try and have a dialogue with China that goes beyond our just our commercial um, and you know um, sort of concerns around um, investments and screening etc etc um, on the EU army I mean, I think we're a very long way off ever having an, an EU army. I think just look at sort of how much money is being proposed put uh, sort of in the EU budget right now uh, for EU defence. I mean, it's it's tiny. Um, and I think where the EU has tried to do more on defence is to try and plug the gaps. So it's been thinking about, OK, well, what 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 can we realistically do? What are the, what are the things? Where can we help NATO in certain of its you know policies, whether that's like moving equipment quickly throughout countries? Are there sort of bits and bobs that we can do? But the general direction of EU defence policy, I think, is basically those member states that want to do more should do more. And those member states that want to do less should do less. Um, and that's much my sense is more of the approach than let's have a, a, a co comprehensive EU defence policy um, and I think where you've seen the EU making sort of slight difference has been obviously in training missions um, particularly civilian and military missions in, in, in neighbouring countries in Africa as well um, so I, I sort of don't see the ambition you know and I was, I was quite interested to see if von der Leyen as the new commission president and a former German defence minister was going to make a difference in that sense but I, I just don't think that that's the priority right now um, and if anything you might see willingness for a common EU border force border guard or whatever um, again coming back to this idea of protecting borders but I just don't see appetite right now for an EU army at all. And Brian for the last word uh, you've obviously been writing an enormous amount about the Huawei uh, issue in Germany and, and in Europe more generally is the EU going to have a turning point on this? We in the UK, we've said, our government has said, you know, with, there's no going back to normal. Um, things have fundamentally changed now. Is the EU likely to come around to a similar thinking or, or are the economic ties and other sort of strategic relationships just too deep? Very interesting what's happening in Britain at the moment, and, and uh, we're yet to see how that will actually unfold in, in real life. But certainly it, it, it is almost a 180 degree shift from what uh, we were hearing in January. Um, so it's, 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 it, it remains to be seen. As, as for Europe, I think, I think commercial interests will prevail as, as always. I think, uh, you know, the human rights issues, the, the concentration camps, the, the way what China is doing in, in Hong Kong, that really doesn't make much uh, of a difference. It doesn't really influence this humongous um, trade relationship that countries like Germany have with China. Uh, and it's particularly uh, with, with the, uh, on the issue of uh, Huawei, um, I, I, quite, I sort of I'm inclined to think that Germany and France will, will, will just uh, sort of uh, open the doors to this type of Chinese investment uh, with, with checks and balances and whatever limitation they impose. But uh, they are facing a situation where the actual telecoms, such as Deutsche Telekom or Orange or Telefonica, actually Telefonica in Germany not, but uh, Vodafone, um, they're actually gagging for uh, Huawei contracts because Huawei is the cheapest vendor. It, they, uh, you know, uh, industry people will say that that's because of the specific uh, economic political system of China, where there is a, there is a possibility to, uh, um, you know, subsidize a, a private, uh, ostensibly private company. So, uh, you know, in the, on the whole, Europe is becoming a sort of a battlefield bet between the two uh, polar rivals of the new global order. Um, Europe is to an extent divided between what Donald Rumsfeld used to call, uh, call New Europe and Old Europe, you know, the former uh, Soviet satellites minus Hungary, 
uh, are all sort of wary of Russia, are all very, very interested in, in, in uh, American boots on the ground, in, in, in forging very close ties with America, because they don't really, historically and uh, perhaps intuitively, they don't really trust Europe in security matters. They need the United States, no matter who's president there and, and what the policy is. And because of that, they're willing to pay the price of perhaps ejecting Huawei and, and also other uh, Chinese investment. And as Regina said, China is trying to obviously to influence that by, by setting up this forum of, of uh, you know, Eastern Europe plus uh, Greece and, and China. But I think they haven't gone really far in terms of actual investment. And I think further down the line, we will see a gap uh, widening between this new Europe and, and old Europe. And I think the Western European countries perhaps will um, actually find an arrangement uh, with China because uh, it will be interesting if they don't, because that would, that would you know, escalate things somewhat because the Chinese um, government is quite uh, um, self-confident now. And I think they have openly and diplomatically and privately threatened uh, all sorts of consequences if, if uh, a country were to sever a trade relationship to the extent of, of uh, not allowing Huawei to bid for the 5G network. So it remains to be seen. But I do, I, I'm inclined, I, I am inclined to think that countries like Germany and France will uh, actually engage constructively with China because they see China as a market that will fuel their growth now and in the future. And Chancellor Merkel has been pretty clear in every single speech she's had on the subject that China is, is the new rising power and that that needs to be accepted and acknowledged and the Western states need to find an arrangement with that sort of factual situation. And I think looking at America, they do have a sense certainly here that this is a power in decline and the future of the transatlantic alliance is, is wide open. So I don't, I don't think they will be putting their eggs in the transatlantic basket uh, for a moment. I think, uh, I think they will be they will keep open uh, their channels to China. Fantastic. Well, as ever, enormous amount uh, still to get through. Now we have covered quite a, a lot of ground here. Thank you, of course, to our wonderful panelists, Friedrich Eriksson, Georgina Wright, Boyan Panchevsky. You've been wonderful, very generous with your time and uh, your thoughts. And we're very grateful to you and hope to convene you again in the future down the track. But for now, thank you very much.